But Tolkien himself has always fascinated me ever since I had the privilege of attending his lectures in English at Oxford. Dennis Geralt talked to Tolkien about his writing and his work, about how this epic mythology was created in the mind of a professor of English language. Long before I wrote The Hobbit and long before I wrote this, they had constructed this, this world mythology. So you had some sort of scheme on which it was possible to work? Well, it meant sagas, yes. Well, wrong, I assume that they got, got sucked into it, as the Hobbit did itself. You see, Hobbit was originally not you know, about his door, but as soon as he got moving out into the world, he, he got moved, uh, sucked into it. So your characters and your story really took took charge. I say took charge. I don't mean that you were completely under their spell or anything of this sort. Oh no, 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 no! no. I don't walk about uh, dreaming at all. No, <laughs> no, no, no! It doesn't uh, an obsession anyway. But you have a sensation that. Um, but at this point, A, B, C, D, only A, one of them is right, and you've got to wait till you see. Of course, I had maps, because you if you're going to have a complicated story, you must work to a map, otherwise you never make a map of it afterwards. The moons, I think, finally, were, the moons and suns have worked out according to what they were in this part of the world in 1942, actually. They must have something, were they? You began in 42, did you to write it? No, I began in the 30s, as the Hobbit was out, in the 30s, yeah. It was finally finished just before it was published, I wrote it? Wrote the draft just before. about 1949, I should think. I never I actually wept at the Dinamo. But uh, then, of course, it was a tremendous revision. I typed the whole that work out twice, and lots of it many times, on a bed in an attic. Well, they couldn't afford the um, cost of typing. There's some mistakes too. And also, what I amuses me to say was I suppose I'm in a position which it doesn't matter what people think of me now. <laughs> some vital mistakes in grammar from a professor of English language, a little rather shocking. Yeah. I haven't that it. There was one where I used this code as a pass pass over the stride. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of things like that, yeah. Do you feel any sense of guilt at all that as a philologist, as a professor of English language, with which you were concerned with the factual sources of language, you devoted a large part of your life to a fictional thing. No, no, actually, it doesn't make me look good. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I, no, no, there's quite a lot of linguistic wisdom in it. I don't feel any guilt complex about the Lord of the Rings. Have you a particular fondness for these comfortable, homely things of life that the shower embodies? The, you know, home and pipe and fire and bed, the homely virtues. Haven't you? <laughs> Haven't you, Professor? Yes, of course. Yes, 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 yes. You have a particular fondness yes, yes. for hobbits. That's why I feel in, I feel at home. I, well, the Shire is very like the kind of world which I first became aware of things. Very like. Which was perhaps more poignant to me because I wasn't born in it. I was born in Bloomfield, in South Africa. So I was very young when I got back, but at the same time, it bites into your memory and imagination even if you, even if you don't think it has. If your first Christmas tree is a wilting eucalyptus, and if you're normally troubled by heat and sand, then to have just at the edge of your imagination is opening up, suddenly find yourself in a quiet Warwickshire village. I think it engenders a particular love of, of what you might call central Midland uh, English countryside based on good water stones and elm trees and small quiet rivers and so on. And, of course, sort of rustic people about. At what age did you come to England? I was opposed when I was only about three and a half. Pretty poignant, of course, because you see, one of the things why people say they don't remember is because it's like constantly photographing the same thing on the same plate. Slight changes simply make a blur. But if a child's had a sudden break like that, uh, it's conscious. What it tries to do is to um, fit the new memories onto the old. I've got a perfectly clear, vivid picture of a house. But I now know that it's a beautifully worked out pastiche of my own home in Bloomfield and my grandmother's house in Birmingham. Because I can still remember going down the road in Birmingham and wondering what had happened to the gallery, what had happened to the balcony. So constantly I do remember things extremely odd. I can remember bathing in the Indian Ocean when I was not quite two and I remember it very clearly. Frodo accepts the burden of the ring yeah. and 
he embodies as a character the virtues of long suffering and perseverance and by his actions one might almost say in the Buddhist sense he acquires merit he becomes in fact almost a Christ figure why did you choose a halfling a hobbit for this role I didn't I didn't do much choosing I wrote the hobbit which all I was trying to do in the role was to carry on from the point where the, where the hobbit left off whenever I got hobbits on my hand didn't I Indeed, but there's nothing particularly Christ-like about Bilbo. Oh, no. No? Yeah. But in the face of the most appalling danger, he struggles on and continues, and, and wins through. But that seems... Well, I thought he was more like an adequate human race. I've always been impressed. We are here, surviving because of the indomitable courage of quite small people against impossible odds. Jungles, volcanoes, wild beasts. They struggle on, almost blindly in a way. I thought that conceivably Midgard might be Middle Earth or have some connection. Oh, yes, they're the same word. Most people have made this mistake, thinking Middle Earth is a particular kind of Earth or is another planet and, uh, you know, in the science fiction sort, but it's simply an old-fashioned word for, the, for this world we live in, as imagined surrounded by the ocean. It seemed to me that, that Middle Earth was, was, in a sense, as you say, this world we live in. But um, this world we live in at a different era. Oh, no, at a different stage of imagination. Yeah. Did you intend, in the Lord of the Rings, that certain races should embody certain principles? The elves' wisdom, the dwarfs' craftsmanship, men, husbandry and battle and so forth? Didn't intend it, but when you've got these people on your hands, you've got to make them different, haven't you? Well, of course, as we all know, ultimately, we've only got, uh, only got humanity to work with. It's the only clay we've got. We should all, or at least a uh, large part of the human race, would like to uh, have greater power of mind, greater power of art, by which I mean that the gap between uh, the conception and the power of execution should be shortened. We should like that, and we should like, of course, longer time, if not indefinite time, which to, to go on knowing more and do, making more. Well, therefore, we make the elves uh, immortal in a sense. I had to use immortal, but I didn't mean that they were eternally immortal, that merely that they are very longevity, and their longevity probably lasts as long as the inhabitability of the earth. The dwarves, of course, quite obviously, uh, couldn't you say in many ways they remind you of the Jews? All their words are Semitic, obviously, and constructed be Semitic. The hobbits are just well, rustic English people, made small in size because it reflects the uh, general small reach of their imagination, but not the small reach of their courage or latent power. This seems to me one of the great strengths of the book, amid this enormous conglomeration of names. One doesn't get lost. At well, least after the first reading, after the second reading of the book. Well, it does need an index. I'm very glad you told me that because I gave a great deal of trouble. Well, you were the master, you see. Also, of course, gives me great pleasure. A good name. I always, in the writing, always start with a name. Give me a name and it produces a story, not the other way about, normally. Of the languages you know, which were the greatest help to you in writing The Lord of the Rings? Oh, no. Yes. No, I do, uh, obviously, for the modern name, you, uh, I should have said that... Uh, well, she was always attracted to me uh, by its style and sound, more than any other. Even though I first only saw it on coal trucks, I always wanted to know what it was about. It seems to me, certainly, that, that um, the music of Welsh comes through in the names you've chosen for mountains and for mm. places in general. Yes. Do you acknowledge this? Yes, yeah. very much. But uh, a much rarer, but very potent uh, in front of myself has been Finnish. Is the book to be considered as an allegory? No. I just like allegory whenever I smell it. Do you consider the world declining as the third age declines in your book? And do you see a fourth age for the world at the moment? Our world? Well, the person of my age, you see, is exactly the kind of person who's uh, lived uh, through one of the most quickly changing periods of uh, narrative history. Surely never been in 70 years so much change. There's an autumnal quality throughout the whole of the Lord of the Rings. You, in one case, um, a character says the story is continuing, but I seem to have dropped out of it. Yes. Um, however, everything is declining and it's fading, at least towards the end of the Third Age. Every choice tends to the upsetting of some tradition. Now, this seems to me to be somewhat like Tennyson's The Old Order Changeth, Yielding Place to New, and God Fulfills Himself in Many Ways. Where is God in the Lord of the Rings? He mentioned once or twice. Is he the one about the Elder? One, yeah. One, yeah. Are you, in fact, a theist? Oh, I'm a, I'm a Roman Catholic. Devout Roman Catholic, yes. Do you wish to be remembered chiefly by your writings on philology, on other, other matters, or by the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit? I 
shouldn't have thought there was no situation if I remember at all. It would be by the Lord of the Rings, I'd take it. It wouldn't be a rather like case of Longfellow, would it? They remember, people remember Longfellow right high water and perhaps one they quite forget if he's a professor of modern languages. So without horn or harp or music of men's voices, the great ride into the east began which the songs of Rohan were busy for many long lives of men thereafter. From dark Dun Harrow in the dim morning with Thane and Captain Road Thangal Sun, to Edorassi came the ancient halls of the Mark Wardens mist enshrouded, golden timbers were in gloom mantled. Farewell he bade to his free people hearth and high seat in the hallowed places while long he had feasted ere the light faded. Forth rode the king, fear behind him, fate before him, fealty kept he. Oaths he had taken all fulfilled them. Forth rode Theoden five nights and days, east and onward rode the Eor Lingas, through Fold and Fenmarch and the Pyrian Wood, six thousand spears to Sun Landing, Munburg the mighty under Mindolowin, Sea King's city in the South Kingdom, foe beleaguered, fire encircled. Doom drove them on, darkness took them, horse and horsemen, hoof beats afar, sank into silence, so the songs tell us. Then, since we must look for fell deeds and the need of all our strength, said Elmer, I counsel that we rest now, and set out hence by night, and so time our going, if we come upon the fields when tomorrow is as light as it will be, or when our Lord gives the signal. To this the king assented, and the captains departed, but soon Elfhelm returned. The scouts have found not to report beyond the grey wood, Lord, he said, save two men only, two dead men and two dead horses. Well, said Elmer, what of it? This, Lord. They were errand riders of Gondor. Hurigon was one, maybe. At least his hand still clasped the red arrow, but his head was hewn off. And this also, it was seen by the signs that they were fleeing westward when they fell. As I read it, they found the enemy already on the outwall, or assailing it when they returned, and that would be two nights ago, if they used fresh horses from the posts as is their wont. They could not reach the city, and they turned back. Alas, said Theoden, then Denethor has heard no news of our riding, and he will despair of our coming. Need brooks no delay, yet late is better than never, said Eomer. And mayhap in this time shall the old saw be proved truer than ever before, since men spoke with mouth. It was night, and either side of the road the hosts of Rohan was moving silently. Now the road passing about the skirts of Mindoloin turned southward. Far away and almost straight ahead there was a red glow under the black sky, and the sides of the great mountain loomed dark against it. They were drawing near the Ramas of the Palenor, but the day was not yet come. The king rode in the midst of the leading company, his household men about him. Elfhelm's Eorred came next, and now Mary noticed that Darrenhelm had left his place and in the darkness was moving steadily forward, until at last he was riding just in rear of the king's guard. There came a check. Mary heard voices in front speaking softly. Outriders had come back who had ventured forward almost to the wall. They came to the king. There are great fires, Lord, said one. The city is all set about with flame, and the field is full of foes. But all seem drawn off to the assault. As well as we could guess, there are few left upon the outwall, and they are heedless, busy in destruction. Do you remember the wild man's words, Lord, said another? I live upon the open world in days of peace. Weedfire is my name, and to me also the air brings messages. Already the wind is turning. There comes a breath out of the south. There is a sea tang in it, faint though it be. The morning will bring new things. Above the reek it'll be dawn when you pass the wall. If you speak truly, Weedfarer, then may you live beyond this day in years of blessedness, said Theoden. He turned to the men of his household who were near, and he spoke now in a clear voice so that many also of the riders of the first Eorred heard him. Now is the hour come, riders of the Mark, sons of Eor. Foes and fire before you and your homes far behind. Yet though you fight upon an alien field, the glory that you reap there shall be your own forever. Oaths ye have taken, now fulfil them all, to lord and land and league of friendship. Men clashed spear upon shield. Eorma, my son, you lead the first Eorred, said Theoden. And it shall go behind the king's banner in the centre. Elfhelm, lead your company to the right when we pass the wall. And Grimbold shall lead his towards the left. Let the other companies behind follow these three that lead as they have chance. Strike wherever the enemy gathers. Other plans we cannot make. 
and we know not yet how things stand up in the field. Forth now, and fear no darkness. The leading company rode off as swiftly as they could, for it was still deep dark, whatever change we fellow might forebode. Mary was riding behind her and Helm clutching with his left hand while with the other he tried to loosen his sword in its sheath. He felt now bitterly the truth of the old king's words. In such a battle, what would you do, Mary Adok? Just this, he thought. Encumber a rider and hope at best to stay in my seat and not be pounded to death by galloping hoofs. It was no more than the league to where the outwalls had stood. They soon reached them, too soon for Mary. Wild cries broke out and there was some clash of arms, but it was brief. The orcs busy about the walls were few and amazed, and they were quickly slain or driven off. Before the ruin of the north gate in the Ramas, the king halted again. The first Eorred drew up behind him and about him on either side. Darnhelm kept close to the king, though Elfhelm's company was away on the right. Grimbold's men turned aside and passed round to a great gap in the wall further eastward. Mary peered from behind Darnhelm's back. Far away, maybe ten miles or more, there was a great burning. But between it and the riders, lines of fire blazed in a vast crescent, at the nearest point less than a league distant. He could make out a little more on the dark plain, and as yet he neither saw any hope of morning, nor felt any wind, changed or unchanged. Now silently the host of Rohrad moved forward into the field of Gondor, pouring in slowly but steadily like the rising tide through breaches in a dike that men have thought secure. But the mind and will of the black captain were bent wholly on the falling city, and as yet no tidings came to him, warning that his designs held any flaw. After a while the king led his men away somewhat eastward, to come between the fires of the siege and the outer fields. Still they were unchallenged, and still Theoden gave no signal. At last he halted once again. The city was now nearer, a smell of burning was in the air, and a very shadow of death. The horses were uneasy, but the king sat upon snow mane, motionless, gazing upon the agony of Minas Tirith, as if stricken suddenly by anguish or by dread. He seemed to shrink down, cowed by age. Mary himself felt as if a great weight of horror and doubt had settled on him. His heart beat slowly. Time seemed poised in uncertainty. They were too late. Too late was worse than never. Perhaps Theoden would quail, bow his old head, turn, slink away to hide in the hills. Then suddenly Mary felt it at last, beyond doubt, a change. Wind was in his face, light was glimmering. Far, far away in the south the clouds could be dimly seen as remote grey shapes rolling up, drifting. Morning lay beyond them. But at that same moment there was a flash as if lightning had sprung from the earth beneath the city. For a searing second it stood dazzling far off in black and white, its topmost tower like a glittering needle. And then as the darkness closed again, there came rolling over the fields a great boom. At that sound, the bent shape of the king sprang suddenly erect. Tall and proud he seemed again. And rising in his stirrups, he cried in a loud voice more clear than any there had ever heard a mortal man achieve before. Arise, arise, riders of Theoden! Fell leads awake, fire and slaughter! Spear shall be shaken, shield be splintered, sword day, red day, ere the sun rises! Ride now, ride now, ride to Gondor! With that he seized a great horn from Guzlaf, his banner bearer, and he blew such a blast upon it that it burst asunder. And straightway all the horns in the host were lifted up in music, and the blowing of the horns of Rohan in that hour was like a storm upon the plain, and a thunder in the mountains. Ride now, ride now, ride to Gondor! Suddenly the king cried to Snowmane, and the horse sprang away. Behind him his banner blew in the wind, white horse upon a field of green, but he outpaced it. After him thundered the knights of his house, but he was ever before them. Elmer rode there, the white horse tail on his helm, floating in his speed, and the front of the first Elred roared like a breaker foaming to the shore, but Theoden could not be overtaken. Fay he seemed, nor the battle fury of his fathers ran like new fire in his veins. And he was borne upon snow men like a god of old, even as Oromi the Great in the battle of the Valar when the world was young. His golden shield was uncovered, and lo, it shone like an image of the sun, and the grass flamed into green above the white feet of his steed. For morning came, morning in a wind from the sea, and darkness was removed, and the hosts of Mordor wailed, and the terror overtook them, and they fled and died, and the hoofs of wrath rode over them. And then all the host of Rohan burst into song, and they sang as they slew, for the joy of battle was on them, and the sound of their singing that was fair and terrible came even to the city. No few had fallen, renowned or nameless, captain or soldier. 
For it was a great battle, and a full count of it no tale was told. So long afterward a maker in Rohan said in his song of the mounds of Munbur, We heard the horns in the hills ringing, the swords shining in the south kingdom. Steeds went striding to the stoning land as wind in the morning, war was kindled. There Theoden fell, fangling mighty to his golden halls and green pastures in the northern fields, never returning, high lord of the host. Harding and Guthlaf, Dunher and Darwin, a doughty Grimbold, Herifara and Herubrand, Horn and Fastred, fought and fell there in a far country. In the mounds of Munbur, going to mould they lie with their league fellows, lords of Gondor. Neither here lo in the fair to the hills by the sea, nor for long the old of the flowering vales ever to Arnach to his own country returned in triumph, nor the tall bowmen Derufin and Duelin to their dark waters, mirrors of Morthon and the mountain shadows. Death in the morning and a day's ending, lords took and lowly. Long now they sleep under grass in Gondor by the great river. Grey now as tears, gleaming silver, red then it rolled, roaring water. Foam dyed with blood flamed at sunset, as beacons mountains burned at evening, red fell the dew in Ramasechor. There the bend it was cut deep through a crag of old weathered stone, once long ago vomited from the mountain's furnaces. Panting under his load, Sam turned the bend, and even as he did so, out of the corner of his eye, he had a glimpse of something falling from the crag, like a small piece of black stone that had toppled off as he passed. A sudden weight smote him, and he crashed forward, tearing the backs of his hands that still clasped his masters. Then he knew what had happened, for above him as he lay he heard a hated voice. Wicked master, it hissed, wicked master, cheats us, cheats us, cheats me, gone. He mustn't go that way. He mustn't hurt precious. Give it to Smeagol, yes. Give it to us. Give it to us. The violent heave, Sam rose up. At once he drew his sword, but he could do nothing. Gollum and Frodo were locked together. Gollum was tearing at his master, trying to get at the chain and the ring. This was probably the only thing that could have roused the dying embers of Frodo's heart and will, an attack, an attempt to wrest his treasure from him by force. He fought back with a sudden fury that amazed Sam and Gollum also. Even so, things might have gone far otherwise if Gollum himself had remained unchanged. But whatever dreadful paths, lonely and hungry and waterless, he had trodden, driven by a devouring desire and a terrible fear, they had left grievous marks on him. He was a lean, starved, haggard thing, all bones and tight-drawn, sallow skin. A wild light flamed in his eyes. But his malice was no longer matched by his old griping strength. Frodo flung him off and rose up, quivering. Down, down, he gasped, touching to his hand to his breast, so that beneath the cover of his leather shirt he clasped the ring. Down, you creeping thing, and out of my path. Your time is at an end. You cannot betray me or slay me now. Then suddenly, as before under the eaves of the Emin Buell, Sam saw these two rivals with other vision. A crouching shape, scarcely more than the shadow of a living thing, a creature now wholly ruined and defeated, yet filled with a hideous lust and rage. Before it stood stern, untouchable now by pity, a figure robed in white, and at its breast it held a wheel of fire. Out of the fire there spoke a commanding voice, Be gone, and trouble me no more. If you touch me ever again, you shall be cast yourself into the fire of doom. The crouching shape backed away, terror in its blinking eyes, and yet at the same time insatiable desire. Then the vision passed, and Sam saw Frodo standing, hand in his breast, his breath coming in great gasps, and Gollum at his feet, resting on his knees, with his wide splayed hands upon the ground. Look out, cried Sam, you spring. He stepped forward, brandishing his sword. Quick, master, he gasped. Go on, go on, no time to lose. I'll deal with him. Go on. Frodo looked at him as if at one now far away. Yes, I must go on, he said. Farewell, Sam. 
this is the end at last. On Mount Doom, Doom shall fall. Farewell. He turned and went on, walking slowly but erect up the climbing path. Now, said Sam, at last I can deal with you. He leapt forward with drawn blade, ready for battle. The golem did not spring. He fell flat upon the ground and whimpered. Don't kill us, he wept. Don't hurt us with nasty, cruel steel. Let us live, yes. Live just a little longer. Lost, lost, we're lost. And when precious goes, we'll die, yes, die into the dust. He clawed up the ashes of his path, his long fleshly fingers dusty hissed. Sam's hand wavered. His mind was hot with wrath and the memory of evil. It would be just to slay this treacherous, murderous creature, just and many times deserved. Also, it seemed the only safe thing to do. But deep in his heart there was something that restrained him. He could not strike this thing lying in the dust, forlorn, ruinous, utterly wretched. He himself, though only for a little while, had borne the ring, and now dimly he guessed the agony of Gollum's shriveled mind and body, enslaved to that ring, unable to find peace or relief ever in life again. But Sam had no words to express what he felt. Oh, curse you, you stinking thing, he said. Go away, be off. I don't trust you, not as far as I could kick you, but be off, or I shall hurt you, yes, with nasty, cruel steel. Gollum got up on all fours and backed away for several paces. Then he turned, and as Sam aimed to kick at him, he fled away down the path. Sam gave no more heed to him. He suddenly remembered his master. He looked up the path and could not see him. As fast as he could, he trudged up the road. If he had looked back, he might have seen not far below Gollum turn again, and then with a wild light of madness glaring his eyes come swiftly but warily creeping on behind, a slinking shadow among the stones. The path climbed on. Soon it bent again, and with a last eastward course, passed in a cutting along the face of the cone, and came to the dark door in the mountainside, the door of the Sammath Naur. Far away now, rising towards the south, the sun, piercing the smokes and haze, burned ominous, a dull, bleared disk of red. But all Mordor lay about the mountain like a dead land, silent, shadow-folded, waiting for some dreadful stroke. Sam came to the gaping mouth and peered in. It was dark and hot. A deep rumbling shook the air. Frodo! Master! he called. There was no answer. For a moment he stood, his heart beating with wild fears, and then he plunged in. A shadow followed him. At first he could see nothing. In his great need he drew out once more the file of Galadriel, but it was pale and cold in his trembling hand, and threw no light into that stifling dark. He was come to the heart of the realm of Sauron, and the forces of his ancient might, greatest in Middle-earth. All other powers were here subdued. And before the sun had fallen far from the noon, out of the east there came a great eagle flying, and he bore tidings beyond hope from the lords of the west, crying, Sing now, ye people of the Tower of Anor, for the realm of Sauron is ended forever, and the dark tower is thrown down. Sing and rejoice, ye people of the Tower of God, for your watch hath not been in vain, and the black gate is broken, and your king hath passed through, and he is victorious. Sing and be glad, all ye children of the West, for your king shall come again, and he shall dwell among you all the days of your life. And the tree that was withered shall be renewed, and he shall plant it in the high places, and the city shall be blessed. Sing, all ye people. And the people sang in all the ways of the city.